morning, I want to introduce you to a very good friend of mine, and his father, Josiah Trenton, from St. Andrew's Church in Riverside. Father, father Josiah is the author of a very excellent and popular book entitled Rock and Sand and Orthodox Appraisal of the Protestant Reformers and their teachings, which is published by New Rome Press. This topic today is history and Western Christianity, an overview of similarities and distinctions. And this is a very important subject. And it's also one that's very close to Father's heart. And he spent a lot of time researching. So, Father, thanks for coming. Thanks a lot, Father. I'm really happy. Ooh. Really, really happy to be at St. Barnabas uh, and to be with Father Wayne and Father Michael. And uh, Kevin, thank you for the invitation, wherever you are. You know, St. Barnabas is the son of encouragement, and Father Wayne is a father of encouragement to me. Uh, we've been colleagues for my whole priesthood, uh, which is less than his since 1993, and periodically, but consistently, just when I need it, something comes to me from Father Wayne. An email, a word of encouragement, a message through another brother priest, a joke, whatever I need, it comes, and it has come consistently, for which I'm deeply thankful. I also like coming to St. Barnabas because I like to know where my young people like to go to church. St. Andrew kids are constantly sneaking down to St. Barnabas uh, to meet the other young people because the average age at your church is about 12 and a half. <laughs> there are so many young people here, which uh, presents a beautiful hope for the advance of Orthodox Christianity in Orange County. May God grant that. And I was in the altar to kiss it before uh, I came out here just now, and I saw a list of pregnant women, exceedingly long. <laughs> they must be uh, obtaining special prayers from the clergy uh, because they're lifted on the walls of the altar. Uh, how wonderful, what a big blessing. The subject I'm addressing is Eastern and Western Christianity, similarities and differences. What I'm hoping to do under that subject, which I hope is acceptable, is to focus on Orthodoxy and Catholicism. Father Wayne introduced a book of mine called Rock and Sand, which is specifically about uh, an Orthodox appraisal of the Protestant Reformation. I'm hoping not to address that, uh, since the Protestant movement was a schism in the West that took place centuries after the great schism between the East and the West, between the Orthodox and the Catholic Church. So what I'm hoping to discuss is our relationship to Roman Catholicism and what the similarities and differences are between Orthodoxy and Catholicism. If you want to, at the end, I hear we're going to have questions and answers. If you want to ask me questions about Protestantism, please feel free to do that. And if you're particularly interested in that subject, read the book. Read the book. Let me talk uh, initially about the great schism and why the great schism is the greatest sorrow, uh, the greatest sorrow in the history of the church, 2,000 years. Now, I'm not meaning in any way to play down um, the rise of Islam, which is the greatest single historical development in the history of Christianity that has affected us. I'm not suggesting to replace that with the great schism. The great schism was an internal affair, a family affair, a horrible, frightful, tear-causing divorce. The worst kind. The rise of Islam was an external affair, something that came upon us and which is still affecting us 14 centuries later. Nothing has affected the, the growth of the Church of Christ and its life in the world more than Islam and nothing in the interior life of the church has hurt us as badly as the great schism. That is the separation of the Patriarch of Rome 
from the other patriarchs of the East and the functional separation, at least for the late last 800 years between Orthodoxy and Catholicism. We often, just for pedagogical purposes, like to use that date, 1054, uh, as the date for the Great Schism. Just so you know, nobody believed that at the time. In 1054, no one in the West or in the East thought that that marked the Great Schism and that that was somehow, you know, the road that we shouldn't have crossed and that was the end. If we really had to pin a date, I think a much better date to solidify that the sense of the Great Schism is the sack of Constantinople in 1204 during the Fourth Crusade. It was at that time when the Latin Crusaders got misdirected and they came into Constantinople and killed our bishops and priests and raped our nuns on our altars. That is when we said, you know what, I don't think we're one. That's when it really hit the people uh, on the bottom. And I don't mean to uh, demonize the Crusaders alone. Uh, we had done our fair share of slaughtering Latins just several decades before 1204. Hostility had, ri had risen to uh, a great fever. So now, while maintaining uh, our orthodox teaching about the church, which is that despite the great schism, the integrity of the oneness of the church has been preserved. Our teaching is that you can leave the church, but you cannot break the church up. You cannot actually cause the church to no longer be one. The oneness of the church is an essential ecclesial characteristic. We confess it in the creed to this day. So while maintaining the integrity of orthodoxy that we after the schism, continue to believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, and that that church is found in the Orthodox Church, not in the Roman Catholic Church. At the same time, I want to um, speak about the schism and the terrible uh, diminution, the terrible um, loss to the church, to the one church that the great schism was and is. That separation brought a practical, uh, in practical experience, a separation for Eastern Christians from a host of Western saints, a host of Western saints. In our experience as Orthodox in America, we often are bringing into the consciousness of our um, Orthodox brethren who are not converts, and our Orthodox bishops who are not converts, we, we who are converts are bringing into their consciousness um, the experience, a, a new revived experience with Western saints before the schism. Many, many times I have uh, interacted with parishioners or visitors who are, were converts and they were catechized and baptized by priests who were not converts and did not recognize their names as authentic Christian saint names. Maybe their name was Chad. The priest didn't know that there was a magnificent Orthodox Western saint named Chad, and so he named him George in baptism. And he ended up not getting to be able to keep his name. This is a consequence, a terrible, terrible consequence of the schism, and that is that most Eastern Orthodox believers no longer had a practical experience uh, a living connection with saints of the West. The progress of orthodoxy for the last hundred or so years in the West, that this is one of the great contributions that we bring. And many Orthodox churches now <clears throat> have synodically confirmed new calendars. Russia, the Church of Russia did this for instance about 10 years ago. They uh, synodically made a declaration about numerous Western saints that weren't typically on Eastern liturgical calendars that, and, put, and the Synod put them on. This is a contribution. They did this because they have so many of their flock now in the West. We've done similar things in Antioch and other churches. We also lost many, many talents and unique gifts that Westerners possessed and contributed to the East. 
these talents and gifts, particularly in the area of missionary endeavors. Western Orthodox Christians prior to the schism were zealous and tenacious missionaries, and I would say for the most part remain tenacious and zealous missionaries. We also lost great uh, talents in organization and achievements uh, in Western culture. These things, when the church fell into schism, were lost to us. We also lost uh, a wide diversity of liturgical rites. One of the consequences of the schism is that um, we went from being a pluralistic liturgical church that had numerous languages of liturgy, uh, but not just numerous language of lit languages of liturgy, numerous liturgies. The West itself had multiple liturgies, not just the Roman Mass, but the Gallic Rite uh, in Gaul and France, what is France today. Um, we've had a fossilization, um, a diminution of what we consider to be the worship of the church. So now it's uh, very hard for contemporary Orthodox Christians to have a grasp of the fact that there might be other edifying, fully Orthodox forms of the divine liturgy. For us, we pretty much know one. That was not the case. That was not the case prior to the Great Schism. We also lost a large portion of our army. A massive portion of our army. Now, at the time, population centers-wise, it, it, the, the proportions were not what they are today. Today, the Roman Catholic Church is at least three times the numeric size of the Orthodox Church. At the time of the schism, that wasn't the case at all. The, the vast majority of the population was still in the East. But nevertheless, when you have an army, just take our army. How many soldiers do we have in the United States? How many soldiers in active duty? 400,000. Can you imagine going from 400,000 to 200,000 in a couple years? That is a massive change, and that's exactly what happened to us. And the schism from, the, from, the, from 1204, uh, the, the tension between the East and the West, between the Orthodox and the Catholic, even our language had to change. Prior to the Great Schism, we were Orthodox and we were Catholic, and the two words were uh, virtually synonymous. We use the words that way. post schism by saying we're Orthodox, we're also saying we're not Catholic. And when a Catholic says, I'm Catholic, he's saying, I'm not, I'm not Orthodox. And for about 700 years, at least from the time of the Fourth Crusade until the early part of the 20th century, the West took a very, very hard line against us. I know this is shocking. This is one of the realities of the post schism Roman Catholic Church is that despite its grandiose structure of authority and its projection of being the church that doesn't change, that church changes so fast you can hardly keep up with it. It is altering its positions and dogmas constantly, constantly. One of the things I'm going to do now is read to you uh, a collection of what, what are called the Byzantine lists. Byzantine lists are uh, compilations from different church fathers and bishops and scholars of the errors of the Latins that led to the Great Schism and followed the Great Schism. It's a whole genre, the Byzantine lists. Um, but after I mention what's on them, I have to make this qualification. Those Byzantine lists are dealing with what's happening in the Latin church until about the 13th century. There have been so many more changes and forgive me, heresies that have been foisted upon uh, the world by the Roman Catholic Church since the 13th century that we have to greatly expand the Byzantine lists. We have to make 21st century Byzantine lists. Now, saying all of that, things did change in the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, instead of the, the typical Latin line for seven centuries that is found, for instance, in Thomas Aquinas's book that he wrote against the Greeks, which means against the Orthodox, just like we would say against the Latins. 
in which he said any Christian, any person not in communion with the Bishop of Rome is damned. That would be us. Uh, that position was radically altered by the, by the Latins. Uh, first, tenuously at the beginning of the 20th century. It came into full force in the middle of the 20th century. I have a, I have a book which is a collection of papal documents of the 20th century about the Eastern Church. And one after another, they grow progressively more positive to us until they really reached a climax in Pope John Paul II's Orientale Lumen, which is a, a papal encyclical he issued, which means the light of the East. He, this Polish, remember who John Paul II was, this Eastern man whose mother was Orthodox, two of whom, two of the three bishops who made him a bishop were from Orthodox families and were serving in the Eastern Rite as Catholic bishops. He had a great interest in Orthodoxy and he was serving a Catholic church, which is even worse today than when he was serving it, in which the bishops did not obey him at all. He had virtually all of South America uh, as communists, in, in clerical robes, in, in promoting liberation theology, which is just communism with the Bible kind of draped around it. And he recognized that he needed a solid backbone, and one of the way, places he found it was by nourishing, once again, a, an interest in us. And he made explicit affirmations about the legitimacy of orthodoxy. Not that we cared that much, but it was a, a nice uh, recalibration of Catholic thinking about us, in which he affirmed the integrity of the Orthodox Church, suggesting that even though we didn't really know it, we were Catholic. <laughs> By the way, Vatican II also made that suggestion, which is rather insulting, about Protestants, that their baptism is really a Catholic baptism, they just don't know it. So all the Protestants are really Catholics. Very interesting theology. Uh, some, certainly not something they ever believed before that. Benedict XVI continued uh, John Paul II's view of the Orthodox East with some slight changes. One of the first things that Benedict XVI did when he became Pope was to slim down the titles for the Pope. And he removed immediately one title, and it made us sad because it was the one title we actually liked, which is called Patriarch of the West. He removed that. <laughs> didn't, didn't fit well with uh, papal infallibility. It sounds too collegial. One of the patriarchs. We weren't I wasn't suggesting that he was a contemporary patriarch of the West. He's not, or was not. Um, but that was, uh, if, we, if, we, if we were going to make a, a, proch, a rapprochement with the, with the Catholic Church, that would be the title we would want the new pope who wants to be Orthodox to emphasize and downplay the rest. And then, of course, we have Pope Francis today. Forgive me, who knows what that man believes? I have absolutely no idea. Absolutely no idea. Uh, a tremendous sad period, I think, for the Catholic Church right now. Now, giving that as an orientation, I like, I'd like to say that as, I'm, as I emphasize now the similarities and differences between Orthodoxy and Catholicism, I want to say right up, right up front that it's very painful. It's very painful to today, not just back then. It's still painful to have separation from uh, our Catholic brethren, especially because in our world, where we're such a tiny minority, and where, when so many Orthodox are so pathetic and are so over-assimilated to American culture that we aren't holding forth our Orthodoxy at all, we're the wealthiest and the most educated of all Christian denominations in America, and we do the least for this country. We're an absolute pathetic shame in this area. And particularly in that context, we, we see that those who are really invested in holding up the Christian banner often are our Catholic brothers and sisters. Look in the field of education. Look in the field of medical care. How many hospitals? Look in the pro-life movement. Look at those who are, who are defending traditional marriage. Look those who are on the front line of defending religious liberty. Now, of course, there are 71 million Catholics in America. And there's about a million active Orthodox. So, I mean, we're 70 times that. But if you took the number of hospitals that the Catholics have and you divided them by 70, we're still not meeting that number. <laughs> you take the number of colleges that, that the Catholics have and you divide it by 70, we're still, we Orthodox are still not near that number. We have a lot to learn. And therefore, I have personally 
as I'm sure you do, many, many friends that I consider mentors, teachers, and leaders in different aspects of my own ministry, especially in the areas that I've just mentioned, that are Catholic. And that I would really um, like to see become Orthodox Christians. I would really like that. And I know that they would be so delighted. One of my very close neighbors, he lives two blocks from me, he's a dear friend I've known for 20 years, and he's a traditional Catholic, and so therefore, even though he's in the diocese, the Roman Catholic Diocese of San Bernardino in Riverside, which has over 1.1 million people, over 1.1 million in a county, like Riverside County is 2.7 million. The largest Catholic diocese in America is just to your west. Diocese of Los Angeles has four out of the 11 million people in LA County. Four million are registered with that diocese. And because of immigration, that's, that number is increasing all the time. But my neighbor friend have to drive past hundreds of Catholic churches to go to church in a decent, in a decent place where they're not uh, celebrating homosexuality, where they're not uh, having banjo bands in the mass, and um, where there are serious priests who are practicing traditional Catholic life. You know, the priest to parishioner ratio in the Catholic Diocese of San Bernardino, 5,000 to 1. 5,000 to 1. And many of those priests, I think more than half, are imports from the Philippines, from Southeast Asia, because they have such a leadership crisis, which has therefore not inspired young men. I mean, why would you want to become uh, a priest these days if the Catholic seminaries are bastions of homosexuality, which Pope Benedict XVI's chief archbishop for overseeing American seminaries announced during his pontificate that they were. The result is that no, you know, decent men don't want to become Catholic priests today, and those that do want to go into tra traditional orders, which, have, which means that they can only serve very few churches, and therefore, just to get a decent mass, to have a normal life, where, for instance, you hear where you can make your confession. Right? Catholics used to, very, in very recent memory, used to confess every Saturday. I have lots of older Catholic friends who that was their life growing up. Their parents took them on Saturday mornings, and they got in line for, for, to make their confession. That's how it was. Today, most of the large Catholic churches in the diocese where I live have posted one hour of confession per week. That's how much time the priest, the overburdened priest, who's always in the hospitals, right, and, and can't do anything. Uh, and even then it's not full, because Catholics just don't confess anymore. They just don't do it. They're, they're, not able, they're, they're so thoroughly Protestantized. They have voluntarily done to themselves what the Protestant reformers tried to make and the bishops have brought it in themselves. So what I'm suggesting to you, what I'm going to go over with you now to describe the similarities and differences between Catholicism and Orthodoxy, uh, I'm doing this also with a deep sense of, uh, of appreciation for Catholics who are struggling to be faithful Catholics in our culture and are leading the way and, and taking us Orthodox by the hands, often very graciously, and helping us go down uh, good paths, really good paths. And the more that we can collaborate with them and learn the lessons that we should already know, but that they're doing with regards to good social uh, work, good deeds in society, the quicker. I was very happy to see <clears throat> that last year was the first year ever in the history of Orthodoxy in America that on Roe v. Wade Day on Sanctity of Life Sunday, um, the Assembly of Orthodox Bishop issued a collaborative pro-life statement with the head of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops and the head of their pro-life committee. So our Archbishop Demetrius, the chair of the Assembly of Orthodox Bishops in America, co-signed with Cardinal Kurtz, and our um, head of our Church and Society Committee, which oversees the pro-life ministry of the church, signed together with Cardinal Dolan of New York City who, who oversees the Catholic pro-life cause. This kind of cooperation uh, to save the life of the unborn, this is something that we only can benefit from as Orthodox. We can only benefit by 
learning to, uh, from our Catholic brethren, these kinds of things. So remember, when I, when I read you these lists, um, remember that I'm saying all of this uh, positive, too, about our Catholic brethren and, and how I think we should relate to them. I should tell you that this, um, this tension, this change of the Catholic mind towards us that has taken place in the 20th century and that offsets seven centuries of rather aggress aggressive Catholic proselytization of the East. Uh, I mean, it was very, in very recent memory, many of our own people, many of our Antiochian people, were so proselytized by Catholics that the Pope would come and build a school in an Orthodox village in the Middle East with absolutely no Catholic population. And he would open it and he would say, tuition is free to all the Orthodox children as long as you commemorate me, i.e. as long as you become Catholic. And many did. We, in many of our towns and villages in Lebanon and Syria today, on one side of the street, there's the Orthodox Church, and literally across the street is the Melkite Church, which looks like our church, does the same liturgy and the same language as our church. What's the difference? At that one point in the liturgy where the priest says, among the first, be mindful, O Lord, of our metropolitan so-and-so, they say, of Pope so-and-so, which makes them functionally, no matter what they look like, smell like, and act like, if you are in communion with the Pope, you are a Catholic. This happened uh, all over the Middle East, and not just in the Middle East. This approach, <clears throat> this aggressive proselytization. But now we see this, this new uh, attitude developing, especially in the last 50 years. And I'll tell you, next year uh, is going to be a very interesting year on this subject because next year will be the one hundredth anniversary of the so-called Fatima revelations. Um, the Fatima revelations took place in 1917 when three sisters uh, apparently saw the Virgin Mary and she gave to these sisters detailed prophecies. One of the prophecies was that Russia, which was just beginning its crucifixion at the hands of the communists, this is, think, this is Bolshevik Revolution year, 1917. She prophesied that in the future, after great martyrdom and desolation, that the Russians would be converted in mass. Now, Catholics have traditionally interpreted that Fatima prophecy as Russia becoming Catholic. Dream on. <laughs> Dream on. But anyway, that's how they've understood it. That's, how, that's what they've thought about it. And I, I remember uh, as a young priest, I, I was... Uh, interacting with some really well-formed, educated, older Catholic men, very much in the know. And they were absolutely the great Fatima devotees. And they basically told me, look, you guys are all going to be Catholic soon. Fatima, Our Lady at Fatima told us this. Russia is going to lead the way. I had a very interesting thing happen on this subject. Two years ago, I, I made the acquaintance and have since uh, had a, a number of occasions to be with this person more, uh, to make the acquaintance of the titular king of Portugal who is named Dom Duarte Pio, who is a devout Catholic and is involved in the pro family, international pro-family movement. And uh, he and his lovely wife, I, I've been able to have three or four dinners with over the last uh, couple years. And he wanted to host uh, the large International World Congress of Families in Portugal next year, 2017, especially because of the number of pilgrims that were going to be in Portugal because of Fatima, because they would, they would be making pilgrimage there for the 100th anniversary. And I said, speaking of that, <laughs> speaking of that, this was uh, after a glass of wine and a long dinner, uh, I decided I was going to go for it. And I said, look, I said, this Fatima revelation, Russia is going to be converted. I said, forgive me. You really think that's what the Virgin Mary, if the Virgin Mary did this, came and appeared to these, these girls, do you really think that's what she meant? I said, because we Orthodox think that's utter, total nonsense. And he said to me, he said, oh, he has a very high voice. He said, oh, Father, I know something about this. He goes, I am personally acquainted with the youngest of the daughters. And I have corresponded with her on many occasions. I think she just died within this last year. He said, I wrote her that very question. I said, I said, tell me what you said. He said, I wrote her a letter and I said, did the Virgin Mary, in your understanding, mean that Russia would become Roman Catholic or 
that Russia would return to her Orthodox Christianity. And the daughter, according to Dom Pio, wrote back and said, it's my understanding that the Virgin Mary meant that Russia would return to its Orthodox Christianity. Very interesting. I asked him if he was going to uh, publish the letter. It'd be very nice if he would. It'd be very, very nice if he would. Uh, and I am not going to forget that I heard that story <laughs> at all. So things are changing. Things are changing. Our unity has been lost, but our interactions, and especially on the Latin side, there have been lots of alterations in their opinion of us. What are the issues that stand between the Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church? What are these Byzantine lists that were drawn up as the East and the West progressively became more estranged? culturally and linguistically initially. This is as early as the 7th century and the 8th century, really hitting a climax during the pontificate of Pope Nicholas and the ecumenical patriarchal reign of St. Photius the Great. And from that period, from the mid 9th century up until the early 11th century, around 1009, the ecumenical patriarch ceased commemorating the Pope in the Divine Liturgy, which is a very clear liturgical expression that he thought he wasn't orthodox dogmatically. And then, of course, we have the terrible events of 1054, and then 1204, and then centuries of division. What are the issues? If you had these lists before you that were made by, some by saints, but mostly by church hierarchs and theologians and canonists, what would you find on these lists? I want to read you some of the things you'd see. First, you would find that the greatest, or what St. Photius called the crown of all evils, is the heresy in the Nicene Creed that was inserted by the Catholics called the Filioque. This erroneous teaching about the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father Filioque and from the Son, does tremendous uh, violence to our teaching about God and the consequences of that heresy are immense, are immense. It wasn't the simple fact that the Pope showed extreme arrogance in altering the one ecumenical creed of the church that the fathers who articulated it said could not be changed even in a syllable. Filioque, that's four <coughs> syllables. Um, it wasn't just that. That was an issue, and that's a secondary issue. In fact, today, if you were using the typical 19th and 20th century lit, uh, priestly liturgical books, what we would call in English the Book of Needs, the Ephologion, where the priest would read uh, the prayers for receiving converts from different faith traditions. If you open the page to how to receive converts from Roman Catholicism, the renunciations that are made focus on two things the filioque, and papal infallibility. Those are the two things that the priest is going to make sure in front of the whole community converts from Roman Catholicism are very clear about and they publicly renounce. Filioque, as St. Photius said, was the crown of evils. It might have been raised as early as 767, certainly in the Frankish kingdom, of Charlemagne and following the Filioque was uh, posited. By the time of St. Photius, councils were held in Constantinople condemning it as a heresy, even though so many Orthodox bishops and priests today do not have the courage or the conviction to maintain that Filioque is a heresy. This is so consistent. Eleven centuries it's been in our synodicon, in our text that we read on the Sunday of Orthodoxy when we anathematize heretics and the bishops that pr promoted these heresies, whom St. Photius called bishops of darkness. Photius said any bishop who teaches the filioque is a bishop of darkness. 
and the Filioque is a crown of evil. Filioque is chief on the list. And by the way, just as a sidelight, if you're interested to know what's so serious about the Filioque, why make such a big deal about one Latin word in the creed, I would refer you to about a 20-page section in my book, Rock and Sand. It's in there because, sadly, though the Protestants were overthrowing many of the papal in innovations, the, the worst of all, they completely accepted. The Protestant reformers, almost universally, the Mennonites, there was one Mennonite creed that rejected the Filioque. The rest, Protestant confessions accepted the Filioque, tragically. But if you look at my book under that, uh, the section of Protestant heresies in the back, which I would mention comes after a chapter on the Protestant virtues, let's be fair, let's be fair, that section covers the Filioque and why it's such a big deal and how it affects our practice and our whole experience of Christian life. Filioque is in the top of the list. Following that is the concept of universal primacy, the thought that has developed in the West, especially in Rome, that the Bishop of Rome is not just Peter's successor, but Peter's personal presence on the earth. It couldn't have helped that when Pope Leo I, the great saint, had his tome read at the Fourth Council in Chalcedon, all of those who were listening said, Peter has spoken through Leo. Forgive me, but I think that went to the Pope's heads because that became fundamental Catholic doctrine that the Pope no longer uh, was just the successor of Peter, but his personal presence, maintaining his authority. And therefore, over the second half of the first millennium, there grew um, ideas in the papacy that the Pope didn't have just jurisdiction over his area, but that he also could meddle in the affairs of the Eastern Patriarchs in Antioch and Constantinople, Alexandria, Jerusalem, and elsewhere. Not just as a last court of appeal, which is traditional, not just maintaining a primacy of honor, but asserting a universal jurisdiction, which has grown to such a height that today, in the Catholic Church, no bishop in any part of the Catholic world becomes a bishop except by the Pope's choice. The, that, that centrality of uh, authority is something totally foreign to the Orthodox world. Uh, the idea that one bishop would determine all the bishops in all the rest of the world is just, uh, forgive me, absolutely foul, absolutely foul to the Orthodox mind. So this universal primacy is next. That climaxed, of course, in the alteration of the creed, right? Because now he has primacy not just over the pastoral affairs of the church, but he has primacy over the dogma of the church and can change it even if previous popes said you can't. And in fact, two centuries before the creed was changed, one of the popes definitively said the creed can never be changed and had the Greek and the Latin, uh, both the original Greek of the Nicene Creed and the Latin translation of the Nicene Creed without the Filioque put on the doors of St. Peter. And by the way, they're no longer on the front doors, but they're preserved to this day in the Vatican. If you go to the Vatican, you can actually see these uh, copies of the Nicene Creed without the Filioque that were put there by a pope who said no pope could ever possibly change the creed. Well, he was uh, proven wrong very quickly. And besides this universal primacy climaxing in a, in a concept not just of universal pastoral authority, but universal dogmatic authority, it, it climaxed, of course, in 1870 at Vatican I with the affirmation that the pope, when he speaks ex cathedra from his episcopal chair, is infallible is infallible. So now you have the universal consciousness of the church being channeled to one bishop. And this, the sad reality, of course, is that with this whole invented structure of universal primacy and infallibility with the College of Cardinals where bishops are not equal, you have some bishops who are cardinals who have a lot of authority and other bishops who only have some. Despite all of that, you have simply uh, chaos, dogmatic chaos 
of the highest sort in the Roman Catholic Church. And it's not just in a few universities in Europe. As I mentioned, it permeates Latin America, where liberation theology is king. It permeates this country, uh, the most influential cardinal for many decades in this country was Cardinal Mahoney prior to his forced retirement. And Cardinal Mahoney, if he was not an explicit heretic, I'm speaking from a Catholic pers perspective, he at least liked to hang out with them because numerous conferences that he held over the course of almost 30 years in the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Los Angeles entertained theologians who explicitly denied the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Oh, explicitly. I have a letter, one of my real heroes, pro-life heroes, who died all, maybe 10 years ago, was a Catholic priest who started uh, Human Life International, HLI, one of the great pro-life arms of the Catholic Church in America. His name is uh, Father Paul Marx, an incredible priest, just an incredible priest. Came from the Midwest and led the, has led the pro-life cause. I have a copy of a personal letter. He was banned <laughs> from the Los Angeles Archdiocese. He had no permission to serve mass anywhere in the, in the Catholic Archdiocese of Los Angeles. Um, and I was inquiring with one of my friends who was close friends with Father Paul about why this was the case. And he gave me a copy, a 50-page personal letter between Father Paul and Cardinal Mahoney, in which Father Paul acknowledged being banned and then told them, look, you better watch out because you're going to go to hell, my friend. You are a heretic. And then he lists in 50 pages all the conferences in which abortion was permitted, promoted, feminism, lesbianism. Cardinal Mahoney established a center for uh, gay ministry and celebrated the mass under gay pride banners. I mean, so far from Catholic life. So, and all of that, despite this... Um, structure that's supposed to keep everybody in line. Didn't, it hasn't worked. It hasn't worked. As we continue down the list past the filioque, universal primacy, infallibility, we come to more dogmatic realities, like the teaching of the Catholic Church about what grace is, and, that, and the rejection of the teaching of the Fathers about the uncreated light. The result of teaching that grace is, is a substance of sort, different from God, you end up with a denial of the traditional orthodox practice of hesychasm, or the use of pure prayer in which you can have communion with God directly and see the uncreated light. This is, of course, the, the drive of our leaders is to be with God and to have the experience of Mount Tabor in their life, to know him and to commune with his light. And this is something explicitly denied by the Roman Catholic Church. Our hesychasts, including great saints like St. Saint Gregory Palamas, are considered heretics by the Catholic Church today because they taught that we can commune not with God's essence, but with his divine energy, and that that divine energy, much as the heat and rays of the sun are different than the sun, but are also the sun, that divine energy is certainly God and his presence. How could our monastic tradition ever be reconciled with Catholic dogma, as long as they maintain a teaching about created grace and a refutation of hesychasm? Of course, there are many soteri soteriological issues that are on our lists. Purgatory, the concept that there is uh, a unique fire that is a purifying fire, not a consuming fire, not a destroying fire, not the fire of hell, and not paradise, <clears throat> not the fire of paradise, which is divine light, but a third reality uh, that is the destination for most believers who have put their faith in Christ, but have not satisfied the demands of God's justice by repentance and deeds of repentance, and therefore must go to this place in order to be prepared over years, sometimes hundreds of years, 
to be able to be fit for heaven. Now, the concept of pur purgatory certainly uh, appeared before the schism, and there were a number of really great Western saints who maintained this teaching. But it exploded in the Middle Ages in the West and became the structure for a whole approach to uh, relations between the clergy and the laity in which the clergy uh, marketed indulgences and raised lots of money on the concept that this money would go to help people who you loved in purgatory uh, so that they could get out. Martin Luther was very wise in his 95 theses to address right away the concept that if the Pope actually has authority to limit or absolutely exculpate any deceased person's time in purgatory, then why doesn't he just do it out of love right now without money? Anyway, it was a great, it was a great point. Our defender of orthodoxy, St. Mark of Ephesus, who was at the attempted reunion council of Ferrara Florence in 1438, left us, left the church, four beautiful homilies against purgatory, where the orthodox teaching is very clearly laid out with regards to this. Now, I should also throw in here that the Protestant notion, which converts and even Many Orthodox who just live in America and have been influenced by our worldly mentality, the concept that you die and bing, you're on a cloud and everything's wonderful, is complete nonsense. It's as big non as nonsense as purgatory is. I mean, we have 40-day memorials for a reason because the process of moving from this life to the next life is not instantaneous, nor is it easy unless you're the Virgin Mary. Uh, it's very challenging and our prayers are very, very important. And the testimony of many saints who went through this, some of whom actually were sent back and gave us details about it, make it very, very clear uh, that this idea that the Protestants articulated in their confessions, I'm most familiar with the affirmation in the Westminster Confession of Faith in the middle of the 17th century where the Calvinists, the, the, the Presbyterians of England, said that at death, the soul doth immediately depart and rest with Christ. Immediately. Problem is that you'll search the New Testament for any reference to immediately about departing. departing. There's lots of references about wanting to depart to be with Christ, but the, how that process happens, the church has information about. That's not revealed to us uh, in the New Testament. So we have to be careful on the other side as well. The Immaculate Conception, which was articulated by the Catholic Church that the Virgin Mary was conceived in a way uh, unlike the rest of us, and that she actually was free of original sin or ancestral sin. This is not a cause of uh, her holiness. We think that that's actually an insult because if the Virgin Mary was not dealing with the same inheritance of death and corruption and bentness that we all have as sinners, which we can't help but pass on to our progeny, which is why we bring them to baptism as children, and so that they can be communicated with life. If she didn't face the same liabilities, then her greatness isn't that great. <laughs> it actually steals from her. But if, in fact, she, as the church says, she was conceived, unlike her son, she was conceived the way that we have been conceived, and yet still was as pure and exceedingly holy as she was, this, this leads us to hymn her, to praise her, and to view her as a very tangible model for us. Our fathers also mention in the lists the alteration of many of the mysteries or sacraments of the church that the Latins have done. And I want to just briefly mention those. Every one of the sacraments of the church have been altered significantly by the Roman Catholic Church, mostly since the Great Schism, mostly post-Schism. I'll use just one practical example, that which we take refuge in every day, all day long, the sign of the cross. 
the sign of the cross is as ancient as the church. Some of our earliest testimonies uh, about its power come from the second century. Uh, St. Anthony, you know, who was born in 250, speaks about the sign of the cross being the refuge of every Christian and the greatest power against evil, causing devils literally to erupt on fire. The sign of the cross is very precious to us. And we know that the sign of the cross was shared commonly between the Orthodox and the Catholics. Uh, we know that all the way through the middle of the 13th century because we have a catechism. This is post schism we have a catechism of Pope Innocent III in which he's teaching his people how to make the cross, and he says to make the cross like we make the cross, even specifying from the right to the left. Sometime after Pope Innocent III, the sign of the cross was changed. That change was criticized by our fathers, not that it eradicates making the sign of the cross, but that it was an alteration of one of the most fundamental practices of the church done again uh, without consideration of the entire East. Baptism. Baptism has been changed both in its form and in its formula. So no longer, as is witnessed in the first millennium of the church, do the Latins baptize by trine immersion and immersion, as the apostles taught us to do baptizing in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. By the end of the first millennium, Catholics were baptizing with one immersion, which very much scared our bishops because that was an Arian practice. But in the Middle Ages, in the scholastic period, even single immersion dropped off from Catholic practice, which is almost universally not done today in the Catholic world, where baptisms are done by pouring, which is a negation of the very word baptizo itself, which means to immerse. And besides the form, the formula also was changed from the passive, the servant of God is baptized, to the active, I baptize thee in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we are not happy with that change and think that it is uh, communicating exactly the wrong thing. Um, placing the locus of the authority to baptize in the priest instead of the priest being the agent of the Holy Spirit to do that. St. John Chrysostom fought that as early as the fourth century. So this was not unheard of, but it certainly wasn't the Latin practice until the schism. Baptism has been changed. Chrismation has been terribly changed in that though the Latin West had the same form of initiation that we did for centuries, meaning that they received people by baptism, chrismation, and Eucharist. They broke up that sacred trilogy of sacraments, and now they, chris they chrismate or confirm when you're a teenager. So you're baptized without chrism. So you have now baptized, that you have a new invention of type of Christians. The, the Latins have actually created three types of Christians instead of one. We know one, baptized, chrismated, communing Christians. Catholics now have baptized and unconfirmed or unchrismated Christians. They also separate the reception of the Eucharist from childhood till six or seven years old. So now you have baptized, uncommuning Christians. You can then have baptized and communing, but unconfirmed Christians. All of this is novelty. And it says, I think, exactly the wrong thing about communion for us. For Orthodox people, the idea of being uh, excommunicated just because you're young. <laughs> Where's the fairness in that? The Eucharist also, for many separate centuries, was served only under one form, not serving the chalice to believers, but only the body of the Lord. The lift also mentioned that the Latins began to use unleavened bread, which uh, is a very consistent complaint of the East against the West, that they, instead of using a risen loaf, a leavened loaf, which symbolizes the whole body of the church. Uh, they used unleavened bread, and therefore, 
serve multiple, they, they have nothing from which to fracture. They have one larger um, host that the priest fractures and serves himself. But the people get unfractured, disassociated individual pieces that come, you know, all pressed, the, really nullifying the a very important symbolism of having one loaf and one cup in the chalice. And we could go on. Fasting on Saturday, something forbidden by Apostolic Canon 66 and the Councils of Trillo of the Sixth Ecumenical Council in Chapter 55. We don't fast on Saturday and Sunday like we fast during the week. And even in a, the most rigorous fasting periods like Lent, Monday through Friday are kept one way, but Saturday and Sunday always are, is experienced as a lessening in honor of the Sabbath and in honor of the Lord's Day. Not so with the Catholics. Their fasting rules, they change tremendously, including altering the Wednesday-Friday fast, today beyond description, which comes from apostolic times. Uh, today, Catholics were lucky if the Catholics will not eat meat on Friday. That would be a major step. The lifts also mention mandatory clerical celibacy. Uh, this was a big issue. In fact, their relationship to sexuality, especially the sexuality of the priests, is a big separating if issue between the East and the West. And I should say something too about that. As early as the First Ecumenical Council, the delegates of the Roman pontiff attempted to get the council to pass a law that all priests, even if they were married when they became priests, must cease from having sexual relations, conjugal union, with their wives if they're going to serve. Uh, the minutes of the council say that one of our great desert fathers, Abba Paphnutius, stood up and said what would become the standard line for the Orthodox to this day. He would say, look, we honor the rigor of the Roman pontiff, um, but to mandate such as a law is to set yourself forward as more holy than the apostles. You're holier than the apostles. <laughs> Who are you to do that? This, is, this was the answer. And Abba Paphnudius won the day, and that would remain a point of contention uh, between the East and the West. We, of course, have many, many standards for, uh, special standards for priests in the, in the realms of holiness, and especially with regards to sexuality. Many things we do that are totally irrelevant to you as lay people, but what we don't do uh, is invent a holier standard than St. Paul <laughs> uh, and the other apostles. This is from Canon 13 of the Sixth Ecumenical Council, we say, since we have learned that in the Church of the Romans it is regarded as tantamount to a canon that ordinance to the diaconate or priesthood must solemnly promise to have no further intercourse with their wives, continuing, however, in conformity with the ancient canon of apostolic rigorism and orderliness. So they're accepting the, the, concept, the word rigorism, but they're calling it an apostolic rigorism, not a supra-apostolic rigorism. Continuing the ancient canon of apostolic rigorism and orderliness, we desire that henceforth the lawful marriage ties of sacred men become stronger, not weaker, become stronger, and we are no wise dissolving their intercourse with their wives, nor depriving them of their mutual relationship and companionship when properly maintained in due season, so that if anyone is found worthy to be ordained a subdeacon or a deacon or a priest, let him no wise be prevented from being elevated to such a rank while cohabiting with a lawful wife. Nor must he be required at the time of ordination to refrain from lawful intercourse with his own wife, lest we be forced to be downright scornful of marriage, which was instituted by God and blessed by his presence, as attested by the unequivocal declaration of the gospel utterance, what therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. And the apostles teaching that marriage is honorable and the bed undefiled. And art thou bound to a wife? Seek not to be freed. We are cognizant, though, that those who met in Carthage, this was a local Western council that the Ecumenical Council now is going to overrule. 
We are cognizant, though, that those who met in Carthage and made provisions of decency in the life of ministers declared that subdeacons and deacons and priests, busy in themselves as they do with the sacred mysteries, according to their rules, are obliged to practice temperance in connection with their helpmates, in order that we may likewise keep the injunction handed down through the apostles and continued from ancient times in force, well knowing that there is a proper season for everything, and especially for fasting and praying. For those who assist in the ceremonies of the sacrificial altar have to be temperate in all things at the time when they are handling holy things, so that they may be able to gain whatever they ask God for. If, therefore, anyone acting contrary to the apostolic canons require any person who is in sacred orders, any priest, we mean, or deacon or subdeacon, to abstain from intercourse and association with his lawful wife, let him be deposed from office. Likewise, if any priest or deacon expel his own wife on the pretext of reverence, let him be excommunicated, and if he persist, depose him. So this was an attempt to take the ruling of the local council of Carthage, which said priests who serve the mass, priests who serve the liturgy, can't sleep with their wives anymore. What the Holy Fathers at the Ecumenical Council did was to take that and say, the effort there was to establish decency and proper preparation for the serving of the sacraments, which does not require perpetual abstinence from conjugal union of married presbyters, but timely, appropriate intercourse, which means that priests do not have relationships with their wives, do not have conjugal union when they're performing the sacraments, when they're preparing to perform a sacrament. A priest would never sleep with his wife the night before he served liturgy. It's just not consonant with the sobriety of fasting and prayer that you're trying to raise yourself to to be able to serve the sacrament. But it doesn't require that at other times you can't sleep with your wife. This is what the, the church is saying. The Catholics don't believe that. But once again, the authoritative rule of the Pope and the practice of Catholic priests over time have been very, very far apart. If you know anything about Reformation history, most of the leading Catholic priests of the time, including the reformers, were living with women. They weren't even their wives, and their bishops knew about it, and they simply paid a bishop, they especially paid a woman tax, that's all they did. It was their penance. We accused them of eating unclean foods, especially uh, what we meant by that was foods with the blood in it or strangled things. Something I think we find strange, a strange accusation today, but it was really a difference between a Mediterranean climate and a Northern European climate where, where certain uh, animals were eaten that weren't appropriate to the East. We, we criticized the West for allowing brothers and sisters in law to marry. We had different laws of affinity. Their monks ate meat. In fact, they continue to do that, which was, is a big scandal uh, to the orthodox ascetical practices. I remember reading uh, uh, an account from the late Metropolitan Anthony Kropovitsky, a very famous Russian bishop at the time of the Bolshevik Revolution, who kind of organized the Russian church in exile. Um, he, when he fled the communists, took refuge in a Catholic monastery, and he became good friends. He wrote, as a matter of fact, he wrote a book there, a very famous book on confession. He had no books, and he wrote the entire book from memory, including lots of scriptural and patristic quotes, just an incredible man. His book's in English on confession. It's a fantastic book. Uh, but he describes how shocked he was because he was friends with these, with these monks, with these Catholic monks, who were serious about their faith, and he saw them not exercising traditional temperance, but eating meat on Wednesdays and Fridays in the monastery. And then at night, he would be in his cell praying, and he would hear the monk next to him whipping himself until he bled. Right. This is this, this concept. Uh, and and he, said, he said in writing, Metropolitan Anthony goes, look, I don't, I don't understand that. Right? You neglect the traditional practice to, to tame your unruly desires, which is not harmful to the body. Temperance, practice fasting. And then by not doing that, then, then you go make yourself bleed and you whip yourself. We also on the list noted that the Catholic bishops, priests, and monks actually served in battle. And it's kind of a historical reality that the barbarian invasions of the West militarized the church, including in the clergy ranks. This, of course, uh, hit a climax during the Crusades where you had whole monastic military orders. This is something very, very offensive to the orthodox mentality uh, about the role of clergy and monks with regards to warfare. We have clergy in the military, but they're chaplains. 
They aren't, they aren't like supposed to be killing people. We criticize the fact that they celebrated more than one Eucharist per day, per altar, per church, or per priest. Some of that was the fact that the, the Latin Mass became served apart from the traditional offices, which you wouldn't see in the Orthodox world. You'd have Vespers and Orthros and liturgy as part of a sacred a trinity of services. But in the Catholic practice, it became normal just to pray the very simple Mass, and therefore they often prayed it multiple times a day. We criticized in the, in the scholastic period and post their clean-shaven priests. We thought that that was um, a violation of the forbiddance of unisex appearance in the Bible. Moses is very serious about unisex appearance, especially with regards to clothing. Uh, we criticized their burial customs because they didn't cross uh, their people's hands like this when they buried them. Instead, they put them like, down like this. We thought that they showed improper reverence for the altar because they left, uh, they allowed laymen to come uh, into the church. We criticized them for sitting, especially this was the case after the 16th century when pews became common after the Protestant Reformation. You know, the Protestants invented the pews because they replaced the Eucharist with a very long sermon, um, and they also got rid of the bishop's chairs. So the whole practice of chairs was completely reversed. For us Orthodox, sitting is a place of authority, right? If you're in authority, you sit. You stand to show you're under authority. Um, in the Protestant world, they got rid of the bishop's chair. They put chairs for everybody because the Eucharist was gone. They were going to preach a long service, and the Catholics ended up imitating that. And uh, we Orthodox kind of have imitated that too in the, in the West, but it's, I tease my people a lot sometimes. If they sit when I don't tell them to, I come out and I'm about to give a sermon and they sit and I'm like, oh, maybe you should tell me what, I'm listening. You're all gonna be giving some great sermon right now. I'm, you know, you're, took your seat and your chairs of authority. I'm just, here I am standing in reverence before you. Uh, uh huh. They also ordain only on four days a year what are called ember days. They serve the Mass in weekdays of Lent. They don't use the vulgar language when they do their missionary work, although that was not a practice all the time in the first millennium. Anyway, you see these, these uh, incredible long lists. And one thing you can conclude, and that, by the way, of course, that's not even dealing with the last five centuries. This isn't even dealing with what we've seen in the last century, or some of the things I was telling you about the decimation of Catholic practice today. But you see that these lists, they're kind of like, um, you would never find a list like this against the Jews or the Muslims. But this is kind of an inter-family squabble. This is, uh, it, even though the lists are strong and they have very many important things, we're, the very fact that they exist show that we have a lot of history and we're really not happy about walking away from each other. We're really not happy about that. And we're going to have a little fight about it and we're going to fuss. Today, of course, as I mentioned, the list would be uh, very, very much longer. I'm a fan of a Catholic priest, scholar uh, named Day, Thomas Day. And he wrote two really powerful books. One book is called um, Why Catholics Can't Sing. <laughs> and it's his record of the overthrow of the sacred art of liturgical chant, Gregorian chant which was as ancient in the West as our Byzantine chant and uh, classic old Russian chant, Slavic chant, in the East, which almost universally is gone today, except a few monasteries that sell CDs to support themselves because they have really great choirs. Um, he also wrote a book called Where Have You Gone, Michelangelo? <laughs> and, th and that book is about the overthrow of the classic sacred art of architecture. And just take as an example the monstrosity of the new Catholic Cathedral in Los Angeles. $189 million. Now, you would think with that kind of change, they could really do something that would just cause the Catholic Church to explode in Los Angeles. They could just buy a block and build a heavenly building. They had a great church. They had a great cathedral. It wasn't big enough. But it was very beautiful. It's a classic basilica. I know because uh, I, was, I did a wedding this summer, and the reception was at that church because it's been turned into a restaurant. 
They actually, the Catholics were going to sell it, and the Muslims were going to buy it. And a Catholic man said, no way. So a Catholic man went, put up the money, bought it from his own bishop, and turned it into a restaurant uh, called Viviana. Viviana is the name of the saint of the Catholic cathedral. Her relics used to be out in the main church, just like they should be. Now they're in the basement, in a little chapel. Saint Viviana has been demoted. She's an Orthodox saint, by the way. If you want to venerate the relics of an Orthodox saint in Los Angeles, go to the Catholic cathedral, go into the basement chapel, and you can see her. But there was an article written in the Latin Mass Latin magazine about 10 years ago. I printed it out, kept it in my files. It's called Churches from Hell. <laughs> and it had pictures. It had pictures of just one church at complete violation of the sacred principles of architecture, which communicate truth. And when you promote and spend money on ugliness, uh, you communicate a very clear message. You communicate a very clear message. When you radically break with architectural tradition, you're communicating a very clear message. When you throw over centuries of sacred musical tradition, you're communicating a very clear message. Do you know that the number of monastics, Roman Catholic monastics, since 1950 until today, has decreased 95% percent. Their monastics used to run their schools, they used to run their hospitals, they don't even exist anymore. Almost completely gone. Revolution is what has taken place uh, in the Catholic Church. I have a friend who is a Catholic monk. His name is Father Cashin. He's the abbot of a monk, of a monastery in Italy. In fact, he just built a, a very, very beautiful Catholic monastery in the hometown of St. Benedict, Nursia. There hadn't been a functioning Benedictine monastery in Nursia for centuries. Being a great devotee to St. Benedict, of course, who is the classic Western Orthodox monastic founder, comparable to our St. Basil the Great. I asked him, we were together in Washington, D.C. a couple years ago, and I asked him, I said, how's it going? I said, how many monasteries in the Catholic world actually follow the rule of St. Benedict? He said, one, mine. In the entire Catholic world, only one actually follows the rules that St. Benedict wrote. I mean, we all read about them, but they've been altered and abbreviated and slimmed down and so many times that it's unrecognizable. And he went back to start again the real thing with real vigil and real fasting and the real, the real St. Benedict deal. But that is truly how difficult it is today in the Catholic world, which means that we have an even larger expanse to overcome in an effort for reunification. I've often thought, what if something did happen? What if you know, Pope John Paul II many times read the Nicene Creed in public without the filioque? He did it, and he liked doing that. What if something happened where the popes would give up uh, the Catholic Archbishop of San Francisco is a friend of mine. His name is uh, Salvatore Cordiglione, great man. He was from San Diego, was assistant bishop, bishop down there. He's a canonist from Rome, he studied in Rome, and a great lover of orthodoxy. He is a great lover of orthodoxy. And I have heard him in public say many times that he believes the Catholic Church should cease saying any council that they've held after the great schism is ecumenical. Because, you know, the Catholics kept on suggesting that their councils were the councils of the whole church, even though we weren't there. He says, we should stop that. We should say they're all local councils and up for discussion. If we could get, if bishops like that were talking, and they said, you know what, that became the position of the Catholic Church. They're going to relegate all post-schism dogmatic decrees to the trash bin and come back based upon the faith of the first millennium and deal with us. That would be a mighty miracle. That would be an incredible miracle. Please, God, may that happen. That would be fantastic. But still, practically speaking, what do you do the next day? This is what I thought. Let's say it happened, and we could all announce in our churches that the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church have been reunited after a thousand years of separation. Could any of us actually go to church? Technically, we could. But could any of us actually go to church in a Catholic parish? I think in where I live, our people just couldn't stomach it. They just couldn't stomach it. They would go there and they wouldn't recognize where they were. They would simply not feel that, that they could do it. It would just be torture for them. 
It would have to be not just a decree from the top, but a renovation, a reincorporation of traditional Orthodox Catholic life with regards to worship and prayer and all the things that we know of reverence in the church. May God bless uh, our interactions with the Catholics and make something, surprise us with something great because it's a pretty challenging picture. <laughs>